Hi, Kitty Cats. I am Amethysta Herrick, your hostess for Gender Identity Weekly, a weekly discussion about identity and gender from the contributors and guests of the Purple Paw Publications website, Gender Identity Today. This content is brought to you by subscribers of Gender Identity Today. If you're already a subscriber, thank you so much for your support. If you would like to support shows just like this one, as well as other content by our contributors, please consider subscribing using the links you're going to find in the show notes. So today, I know first try, right? <laughs> so today, you know I'm going to leave that in, by the way, because it's a good joke. Um, mm -hmm. Today, I'm, I am joined by Oceana Tethenhart. First of all, Oceana, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Of course. Oceana, if you don't know her, which if you don't, you know, you must be living under a damn rock. I, I have called her a world-renowned influencer, award-winning writer and model, and the thing is, none of these is untrue. So there you go. Um, You're turning me back. Oce I'm blushing. <laughs> oh, come on. So we met through Medium, um, like I know, like I met most of the people I know, and then we started working on on other writing projects, and through all the work that I've done about gender, I've just you know I've wanted to start writing about sexuality in particular and, and its relationship in gender, in our, you know, just in general, our, our identity. And Oceana, I know your past work um, includes covering the sex industry as a journalist, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and there are probably places you could name, but we, we won't do that just now, but. <laughs> I, could, <laughs> like, I could tell you stories. So many stories could I tell. You told me enough, or you told me a few already that is enough to make me go, I don't want to work there. So, <laughs> um, but we, so, I, you know, what I want to do though is, is have a, a discussion. You know, I think it's interesting why that sex sells as well as it does, because so much of our, our, um, the foundation of like this in Western society is based on Puritan ethics. So it's kind of fascinating to me that that sex would sell as well as it does because Puritan ethics say, you know, you're not supposed to want sex. What the hell's wrong with you? You know, that's, that's for weird people. So, and I know that there is a relationship between gender and sexuality. And since I happen to be transgender and you identify as non-binary, at least, um, let me let mm -hmm. you talk for a sec, but okay. I, myself, I, my pronouns are they and she, I use she because I realize I do look like a girl to most people. But if you take a look at my outfits on my day to day, like even this one, I actively try to hide the curves of my sure. body so that I look more masculine. Um, I myself consider myself a gender. It's just that I view my breasts and VV as a birth defect almost. I don't want either. Sure. So I I get that. And if I could trade with you. Oh my god, girl, I I totally would be down for that. Right? I know. I feel oh like well. I'd be like the world's most flamboyant gay man though. <laughs> it could be pretty fun though, actually, come to think of it. So um Yeah. I'd I'd but, go for that. Yeah. But both of us have had lots of consideration around our around gender at all, because I think most people think, well, you know, gender is just something that comes right. The the prevailing anti LGBTQ rhetoric equates the two says, hey, you were born with these chromosomes, so you must be this gender, you know, this sex and this gender. And, you know, I've written quite a bit about that, but sort of as a corollary, sexuality is supposed to derive from that. If you were born with XX chromosomes, then you must be a woman, which means you must, you know, want to have sex with men. And that's a relationship. I don't think it's the only relationship. So yeah. I've prattled for like, shit, four minutes. Oops, I didn't mean to. I always end up cursing in these. But I think that there is a relationship, but I'm interested in your thoughts. What do you think is the relationship among sex, gender, and sexuality, but, you know, if you want to just limit to gender and sexuality, that's cool, too. See, I always view sex as just, like, the purely physical. We all each have a vessel. Some of us have boobs, some of us have 
penises, some of us have something that's actually in the middle that's intersex. It happens at about 1% of the population. Yeah. Um, but our physicality only has like limitations on what we can do physically. Gender is all up in the mind. Like, I can tell you right now, when I was a little girl, I'm putting girl in quotation marks because you're going to be able yeah. to hear this. Um, I like it. I felt really wrong, like really wrong wearing dresses. Like, I'd wear them because, like, I like the breeze between my knees. And, well, honestly, I'll walk around in a smock if I can. Like, I don't like very high-maintenance clothing. But I didn't like the whole, like, girly hairstyles. I didn't like the fact that, like, even the clothes on me or, like, hanging out with other girls and talking about what they did, it felt wrong. I felt, for lack of a better term, emasculated. Oh, interesting. And, okay. and it almost felt like I had to pretend to be someone I was not. Like, I was putting on a play just so that I could perform. Sure. And I realized that something was not right there, even before I had the right word for it. Because I didn't want to be a boy. But I definitely did not want to be a girl. And the more that people saw, you know, my boobs, my butt, like the things that have gotten me very far in the adult film industry, just as a journalist. Um, sure the more they started cloistering me into this weird Barbie box type thing that I didn't really resonate with. And at the same time, I was starting to develop feelings for girls. Like I've had a lot of male lovers, way more male than female, but that's more or less just because I'm pansexual and I'll be like, okay, this person looks hot. I'll hump it. This person looks hot. I'll hump that yeah. one too. Um, but I, th I honestly think that to a point, my lack of gender and the way that I felt about my body was what made me question my sexuality. I was like, why am I attracted to just this person? Is it their eyes? Well, this girl has eyes just like that. This boy has eyes just like that. This person has the same kind of wit. And to a point, I think that's why I see a lot more trans people who are open about their sexuality. When you're cisgendered, everything kind of gets handed to you on a plate, including your life Agreed. path. Yep. Yeah. Like, okay, you're a boy. Here are some sports items. Uh, you can run a home run in hockey, um, or whatever <laughs> they do in that sport. And then I think you're going right. to get a girlfriend. It's going to be the it's going to be the cheerleader because you're Johnny Football Star. And then you're going to work at a used car dealership or whatever is common in your area that makes a lot of I'm money. Sure. And with the girls, it's like okay. The goal for the girl is to be the cheerleader or to be the punk rock princess, one of the two. Sure. And, like, you know, as a girl, you don't want to get too dirty. You don't want to get your hands in there. You have to be caring. As soon as you're, like, 11 years old, people are going to assume that you want to babysit. People noticed that that was a really bad idea for with me because, like, I handed a kid, like, a butcher knife. I was like, here, go play. Um, I was like 11 at the time and like, my parents were like, no, 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 they're not like you. They don't get to play with knives at that age. I was like, Oh, sure. they're like, yeah. After that, no one asked me to babysit. <laughs> um, I mean, I grew up playing with weapons. So that, so for me, it seems normal at the time for everyone else. Sure. There was a lot of issues there, but because you're cis, there's a lot of stuff you don't question. And there's, sure. one phenom yeah. there's one phenomenon that I personally noticed working in the porn scene that most people don't really talk about. And it's the cisgendered man who, after 30 years and a marriage and two kids, comes out as gay. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. And a lot of the times the one thing that always stuck out in my mind was how they said, I just thought it was supposed to be that way. Right. Right. We don't question it. Not at all, because there's a social aspect to this. There are expectations 
from society. You know, you grow up with a penis. You're supposed to want to be, you know, married with whatever you said, two kids for 30 years. But it's it's not the, I don't think that's true. Exactly. It it's it's not true. It's not even healthy to just have other people dictate your future like that. But when you're cis and you know, you're like, "Okay, I'm a boy. This makes sense." And then you're gay. It's just, "Oh, I'm a boy. I like girls kind of." Okay, this is nice. She's into me. Uh, I don't want to do this. Like, then, then you notice that there's some sort of weird disconnect. Every, all the other guys are talking about how great sex is. And then you're just sitting there. You're like, sure, sure. That works. <laughs> but then you notice Johnny football star with his muscles, just like in the shower room. And you're like, why do I feel this? Why, why am I questioning right. what's supposed to happen? Right, right. So I do think that, like, trans people have a better relationship with their sexuality because we're kind of forced to question our gender and sexuality at a younger age. Like, yes, yes. What's your take? I, I have a thought around that, actually. But the... <clears throat> If I were going to try to define, and I'm going to, this will be a gross, gross um, oversimplification because it's what I like to do. But um, if I were to define gender and sexuality, like gender to me, actually, let me, let me take a step back. Here's a definition first. I'm going to use the word beauty, but it doesn't have to mean physical beauty. It could mean, um, you know, admiring somebody's physical traits, but you could be ad admiring their intellectual traits. You could be admiring achievements, you know, wh however you want to put that. But I'm going to use the word beauty to to imply something that that, uh, you know, is that, that could be thought of as attractive. So and, and that's very vague. I get it. But from that definition, gender to me is expressing the way that you want to express your own beauty. So like to me, I love, I love hair. I love eye makeup. You know, probably I should like other makeup because I'm getting old enough. But um, these are the ways that I express myself. And, you know, now in, in my writing, I've got a certain style. But these are ways that I want to express my beauty. And that I believe is gender. <clears throat> Again, a gross oversimplification. And, you know, somebody's going to, you know, write in and go, you're an idiot. Again, you know. Welcome sexuality. to the Sexuality. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Thank you, YouTube. Um, but sexuality is how we, what we find beautiful in other people, in, in other people's expression. So the two of those are related. They both stem from our standard of beauty, our understanding of what we think, you know, is attractive how we want to show it and how we want other people to show it. So, so there's a relationship there, but not, um, you know, it's not a direct relationship, certainly not related to physicality necessarily. Um, but the point I was going to make there, cause, cause, cause we were talking about, um, you, you had said that transgender people in particular tend to notice this better. And I think that's true. I think that's true because we have to, we have to question our standards of beauty because mm -hmm. society, at least to me, was like, why would you why would you want to wear that dress that Oceana doesn't want to? Right. You know, why do you want to why why don't you want to run a home run in hockey? Although I grew up in Southern California, like I don't think we have hockey. I don't know. Maybe certainly not when I was a kid, because mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever any ice in Southern California in Los Angeles. Lucky. Right. I know. Well, now we live in Colorado and there's a ton of ice, so it's cool. I'm making mm -hmm. it all up. But this is why I think um, this is why I think we, you know, transgender people in particular notice these things is because we get we have to question these from an early age. We have to question who we are and what our standards of beauty are because we're told they're wrong. So. Yeah, there, I think I finished. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> um, 
I absolutely agree. The other issue that, like, I have with gender and sexuality is that gender is the mental. But for most people, when you talk about sexuality, they're not talking about the mental. Like, no, there's a lot of no. there's a lot of men who I've met who I'm pretty sure are trans women. They just won't say it. Sure. They Agreed. have the same they have the same affectations and you know what I mean by that. I do. I was just doing like, them. Yeah. Just... Like they're the type who also will faint if they are asked yes. to eat at Burger King cuz they have to watch their waistlines. And <laughs> like you know the, there some of them are into women, some of them are into men. But sure. like if they wanted to say that they were in a lesbian relationship, most most women would take one look at them, like, and I'm going to say that this is, like, they're not transitioned. They just look sure. like they're out of a Bill Blass magazine or a Brooks Brothers magazine. Yes, I'm talking about somebody who I've met in passing. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, but it, they just looked like a very clean-cut guy, and they're attracted to women, but, like, if you ask a lesbian to date him even though it's clear that mentally he's trans lesbian's gonna sit there and go uh no certainly not yeah like most people i know who are queer they're down with like trans people as a partner as long as they've done a little bit of transitioning you know what i mean right yep yep but even then there's that weird divide where People don't necessarily, they don't want to say that they want the bits and pieces when they're talking about right. sexuality, but they do want it. So how do, how do we actually talk about the physical side, but also keep in mind that there's a mental aspect to sexuality as well? That's a huge issue right. on right. dating sites. Oh, Absolutely. Because I think you're calling it mental. I, I would call it um, behavioral. Like I use, I would just, because I'm doing the little affectations that you're saying, you know, this is. I, I sound like a guy. I realize this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's great. This is why this conversation is so good. But um, I mean, there there are behavioral. I mean, one of the things that, that you know, at least in trans, because most of a lot of the friends I have are transgender women that I've made in the past like couple of years. And it's interesting to see people who start transition and kind of leave off at, at hormones. Not and this is a, this is not a value judgment. It's not to say that you should not take hormones. It is interesting though to see people who will go very far in transition but behaviorally are like very obviously, you know, still whatever gender they they they're, they're transitioning from um and, and we you know we could say well this is fluidity you know whatever but yeah so much of of gender i think is behavioral and, and sexuality like looking at somebody and going see i, I like that because but an exactly. interesting point so an interesting point is it just hit me in the head i forgot i was going to mention this before and i forgot when i was talking about the two standards of beauty you know what I want to express is actually really similar to what I also find attractive, but I don't think that's typical. Like I always, you know, when I would see effeminate men with dark hair and pale skin, you know, sure, I'll date that guy. But if I saw, you know, a girl with pale skin and dark hair, I'm like, sure, I'll date that girl. Um, I see beauty anywhere, I think. But I don't think that's typical. I think, mo you know, you get the girly girl who goes, well, I want to find, what do you call him, Johnny Football? Is it Johnny? Yeah, Johnny Football the word? Star. Yeah, Johnny Football Star. Very different, right? She doesn't want to be Johnny Football Star, but she wants to date Johnny Football Star. And Johnny Football Star, presumably, doesn't want to be girly girl, you know, but wants to date girly girl. So it's interesting. Those two standards are, of beauty are different in many people, not in me. But, you know, I mean, there's definitely like two different sides to sexuality. It seems like the more cis hetero you get, the more there's that dichotomy of big, mm -hmm. strong gorilla man and 
yep. tiny frail girl, or sometimes if it's a little bit rarer, this is usually with within the femdom world, as you might know. Um, it will be big, strong, scary woman and tiny, timid little man. But like, why would I know about that? I don't know. What have you heard? <laughs> I'm sorry. Keep going. I'm kidding. So, Everybody knows. So, like, you know, there's that dichotomy in cis relationships that you don't really see in most gay relationships that I've seen. Right. Right. They're like, when I've when I've met lesbian couples, I'm like, this all makes sense, because like. This one couple of girls I know who they were dating, I think that they got married for a while. Oh, cool. Like, they were both absolutely shockingly gorgeous people. But I could tell you that if I got drinking and my loud mouth came out, I would probably have been pulverized into a tiny little pile of bones. And that would be all that would be left of me. Sure. Because they're both very scary looking girls, but they're very beautiful. So I was like, this makes sense. And then there's always, mm -hmm. like, the eco-hippie lesbianism. Like, that's yes. a trope for a reason. Oh, for sure. And yes. then I'm like, okay, crunchy goes with crunchy. Okay, this makes sense. You don't see crunchy with corporate like you do in a hetero relationship. Right. Oh, my gosh. I didn't think of that. You are that. That's totally true. You'll see preppies together. I don't think we still use that word, but... You'll you'll see people like that together, but you won't see the um 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 like it, it's okay to to be very disparate. Like opposites attract, I think, really only makes sense when you're talking about people who are cisgender, people who can be who can who see opposites. I guess is how I'd put it. That's I mean, a good point. I've tried, like, I befriended somebody who had a crush on me. And she was like ultra preppy, hyper sheltered, and I'm me, which is basically sure. the polar opposite. Sure. Um, the thing is, is that the more that she realized like what it meant to not be sheltered and like, you know, what it meant for me living out on my own, the people who I knew, the lifestyle that I lead, like, you know, the drinking and everything like that, her attraction to me died. Oh, sure. And I could say that's just because, you know, I'm kind of a messed up person when it comes to drinking. Or it could be the fact that I lived in a rough neighborhood and she still lived with her parents. Whatever it was, like, I understood it. But I also realized that, like, that's never stopped a hetero relationship for me. It's almost right. like there's a need in hetero relationships, not necessarily to find somebody on the same wavelength but to find almost like a yin to the yang while head while mm -hmm. uh homosexual relationships are more about two of a kind peas in a pod yep yep no i agree with that it's a good point i you know it's, it's not to change this is, this is not changing the subject entirely the cuz you made a point about like you know you were kind of scary and there was there was a girl who was not scary who was attracted to you because when I lived in when I lived in Georgia and I was all, you know, gothed out and, and, you know, leather pants and, you know, bondage belts and lots of rings and lots of eyeliner, pale and tragic. See, right. Thank you <laughs> Thanks for helping me out. Um, like the the. The most, because I was in Georgia, small town Georgia, and I got like the most, I don't know what the word is, like Georgia peachy girls would be like, oh, you seem very interesting. Interesting. I'm like, yeah, would you care if I bit you really hard? And they're like, sorry, had no idea I'm the flying fuck out of here. I, you're, you know. So Yo, anyway, I think that would, <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Are we going to talk about the big titty goth girlfriend trope now? Oh, you know, we may as well, sure. But Bro, it's a, but it, there's a trope. I mean, there's a reason there's a trope for that too, right? Because that's a huge fetish. You know, people go, she's kind of scary. And she's feminine enough, but she'd probably, like, do me up the backside with a, with a, a, a strap on. But, you know, 
In the meantime, I'd be able to look at her. That, I mean, except for when I'm bent me. over and then not, you know, then yeah. not, I wouldn't be able to look at her unless I was, but it's a huge trope. It's a scary girl. Mm hmm. Like, part of me is a little bit salty about the whole big titty goth girlfriend thing. Because when I was 18, sure. I was gothed the fuck. I mean, the F out. Like, we're talking, I used to wear elegant gothic Lolita clothing, so oh, I, like, awesome. that was, like, the period where I doubled and tripled down on trying to act feminine to sure. try to, like, you know, make my life easier, and it just made my life way worse for mo for a multitude of reasons. I had the EGL clothing. I had the fancy frilly umbrella. I had mm -hmm. the black lipstick on. I had purple hair. You know how many guys who were, like, the Johnny Football star type? like approached me diddly freaking like, squat they did not want to be seen in public with me they did really? not want to introduce me to the friends now like 15 years later there are like these same people hitting me up on in my dms they're like you're so hot i've always wanted a goth girlfriend i'm like no you didn't <laughs> go back to becky come on go go shoo shoo out of here oh that's funny like i'm just salty man <laughs> but then why is that a, why is that a trope then because i think it really is you know people love the scary they love they, the scary they love the scary but they like the scary in theory goth oh, they're not girls gonna marry are, the scary yeah goth girls are a trope because most people specifically guys I've noticed that they have a craving to be vulnerable or to have someone who looks like they can hold their own. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of them, they like the look, but they're afraid of what other people will say. Um, or they like the look, but they're like afraid to approach a goth girl or they're afraid of, you know, what hanging out with a goth could reveal about them. Right. And the funny thing is, is that, like, I personally have a fetish for preppy guys. Like, specifically frat boys. And I feel like this is probably oh, me just gosh. working out my trauma. Yes. It <laughs> probably absolutely is. But, like, you know, even, like, former frat boys are like, yeah, I was in a fraternity. As soon as I'm like, oh, so tell me more. They start flinching. And I'm like, okay. You're afraid. I understand. Sure. So, go, little frat boy. Graze on mm -hmm. your open field of I don't even know what you're doing. But, you know. Right. And to a point, I also I also kind of feel like that also is a gender expression issue. Because goth girls, they're hyper feminine, but there's no denying that there's a butch edge to them. Oh, yes, absolutely. That, I mean... When, when I was, because, you know, I was, I didn't actually start transition until last year, <clears throat> in 2022. But when I was a graduate student, I would dress up and I had, you know, beautiful, long black hair and, you know, but I would scratch people, you know, I would, people, the, there were, there were frat boys wanting to come up and dance with me in the, the club. And I would, I mean, I would, because I, I would have like I had long pointed black fingernails. See, yours aren't pointed; they look square. But they're actually like need, oval. Are they? Oh, good enough. Okay. I, I mean, I had like draw blood kind of, you know. Oh shit. <laughs> well, that was that butch edge. It's what you're saying, you know. But these the dudes loved it. Like I, you know, I there was never a chance I was not going to get drunk. I mean, I didn't even have to bring money because it was like every frat boy was like, oh, gosh, you seem really fun. I'm like, that I am. Let's dance, little boy. Oh, gosh, what's what happened to your face? Oh, it's fine. You won't feel it in the morning. How about another drink? You know, the I have a tendency of biting my dates. So I'm yeah, like, well, hey, yeah. nuzzle, nuzzle, chomp. Right. It's a love bite. Mostly. Mostly. Partly. <laughs> so, so here, so here's an interesting thought because now we're now we're going to start talking about physicality. Actually, everybody loves sex, right? I mean, we're talking about preppy boys and everything. You know, you the Lolita, the Lolita goth girls. Um, everybody loves it, but nobody, 
feels comfortable talking about it. Like there's always, uh, you know, you have to get like, um, you know, Oprah has like a, it's on a very special episode of Oprah, you know, we're going to talk about sex. Like it's a bad thing. But if we don't have sex, like the species doesn't perpetuate. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's part of our puritanical upbringing, but mm -hmm. there is definitely a time and a place to talk about sex because speaking of somebody who's like, you know, exposed to sex at a very, very, very early age. Sure. Like one of my, one of my first like computer games was Rex Nebular and the Cosmic Gender Bender. Okay. I don't know that one, but it, it made me question my gender. And ever since then, I was like, I need a gender bending device. Anywho, nice. <laughs> um, I was exposed to a lot of sexuality, a lot of sexual content when I was younger. And I do feel it had a negative impact on me. Really? So, okay. I mean, to be fair, a lot of the stuff that I was shown at that age encouraged like hypersexuality. Don't, you know, okay. actually stick up for what you want type thing. So there was that aspect of it. And I feel like that's one of the reasons why we as a society do need to have a little bit of safeguard. Um, porn addiction's at an all-time high. And mm -hmm. it's like, I speak as somebody who works in porn. Um, it does mess with your brain. I've noticed how, like people who watch too much porn, people who work with too many, with too much cam models and become quote unquote, like major clients of these people, they, sure. they treat people differently. And it's because they have a hard time extricating what they see in the cam world and in porn world versus reality with media, sure. you are what you eat. And that also comes to topics of discussion, but sex is always going to sell because for everyone except for like the one to three percent who are on the asexual spectrum, it is sure. a primal drive. That's like saying food is not going to be popular, bro. <laughs> right? You're probably going to eat. True. Mm -hmm. But but do you you know in um in Victorian era England there were there was so you know you want to talk about puritanical ethics. I mean, in Victorian England, everybody would think about sex. Everybody was, cause you know, there was a lot of, a lot of exploration around sex in the back room, but you certainly didn't talk about it. And you certainly didn't, um, you know, you certainly didn't, uh, you know, try to like display that you wanted it and everything. And, and there were maladies. I'm, I'm going to use the word malady, which is probably the wrong word, but there were conditions ultimately that, that, doctors, you know, tried to treat um, with Victorian era women, usually upper class um, Victorian women. Yes, like that. Yes, hysteria. Um, you know, I'm trying to think of like other other. But it was really like, these are just people who really needed a good fuck. You know, at the end of the day, it was like, just give them a good fuck and they'd probably be OK. And the reason the reason why I think this occurred is because there was a difference between what they wanted and this massive sense of guilt, you know, that, God, I'd love to get laid, but I'm not supposed to love that. Well, go ahead. You, you, you have a thought. Go. <laughs> there's actually an interesting uh, factoid about Victorian era England and the U.S., which most people don't realize. The U.S. already had Puritans. But what most people right. don't realize is that pre-Victorian royalty was famous for debauchery. Oh, like, sure. Famous, famous. Like, they had orgies, they had mistresses. What Victoria did was, because it was starting to become so scandalized, because there was, like, all this fallout, illegitimate children, this, that, and the other, she reined it in and started acting puritanical and started mm. talking about the purity, the propriety... You have okay. to be proper, cover yourself. It was completely different from what it was before. And interestingly enough, Queen Victoria herself wanted birth control, but no one would give it to her because she needed to continue to produce heirs. Oh, sure. Right. So there was a lot of like 
hypocrisy, a lot of double speak in the world sure. of Victorian England. But the thing is, is that the Queen's influence on England and then because Americans always viewed the British as upper class, sure. America by default, we're stuck with that weird feeling of shame or that it's not proper. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. with America, we have it compounded because we also have a very, very vocal evangelical growth here. Yes. So rather than just sit there and be like, you know, you should only have sex because, you know, you're married and, you know, you love each other. And here's why it actually reduces a lot of the headaches that you could have with STDs, this, that, and the other. Which is which they isn't actually entirely bring true, it, but... It, I mean, if, if the only sex partner you have in your life is your spouse, it's going to be very hard to catch an STD unless your spouse is walking out. But, yeah. like... You know, there's there's a lot of, like, shame that the church tries to use to control um, a lot of its parishioners. And this is not all Christian churches, obviously, right. but it's enough of them in, a, in the United States to cause a very overt um, issue in a lot of people. Because right. you have enough people who are practicing... And see sex as a shameful act because they're told to view it that way. Yes. It was actually St. Augustine who made sexuality out to be this massive sin. Jesus didn't view that that way. It was actually no, certainly not. C- centuries afterwards. It just yeah. so happens that the teachings of St. Augustine ended up really modifying Christian doctrine to such a deep extent. Mm-hmm. That most people don't even realize that the shame that they feel all comes back from this one dipshit from like the classic era. But but, I mean, paganism, I mean, paganism is so based on the idea that that you need both masculine and feminine. And the, you know, the union is pretty much the highest value you can achieve. I mean, so in, in the Catholic Church, naming like the Roman Catholic empire needing to to squash out paganism like that was one way to do it this is why we have pictures of the devil the devil that's like really pan or like the green man you know it's like Mm -hmm. pagan imagery that they said no see this is what's so bad this idea of being wild and being you know free enough to go out and like sleep with somebody you know why would you do that oh my god don't sleep with somebody that's terrible so I, th- I think some of this comes from, are you pulling up a green man icon? I'd love to. Oh, I thought no, you were doing. I'm, uh, I'm petting this guy right here. Oh, hello. So he's an orange man there, I think. But Yes. <laughs> but but I, like, I think that's part of, <laughs> right, of course, from his nap. But I think that's part of where that comes from is, is you know, just the Christian church going, well, we need to make sure that paganism is or pagan, you know, pagan um, traditions get torn apart. And the way we do that is by stigmatizing sex, you know, at least um, to a certain extent. So, because I don't see any reason why we should be embarrassed by sex. Everybody wants we it. We really shouldn't. Like, honestly, it's like food. In a, in a healthy society, I think that sex jokes will be treated like fart jokes or poop jokes. They'll be like, okay, cool, you farted. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> like, because, you know, funny stuff happens in the bedroom. It, that's just normal. And yes. it's interesting that you said that about Christian sexuality, because one of the people who I remember talking to and um, like, you know, I was raised cult adjacent. My best friend was sure. in a culty cult, not like a normal cult. Like this is a culty cult. They have news stories on how culty it is. Um, oh as you could tell from like me playing with like live steel weapons at like 10, 11 years old, culty cult, very culty. It sounds creepy. Yeah. Yeah. Like that was considered normal for me. Um, the one thing I remember hearing from another former cult member who I, I actually befriended decades after, you know, my friend got shipped off to the DMZ he said, when they control your sexuality, they control you. 
Oh my gosh, so true. Yes. And in and every ever since then, I noticed that every single major cult, religion, and political thing that is all about high control, every high control organization out there will try to steer your sexuality one way or another. Mm -hmm. That can't be by coincidence. I'm sorry. No, no it's a very deep-seated desire within us to, to have connection. And, and, and I mean, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say most people enjoy a good orgasm. I sure do. I do. I mean, I'm, you know, but, but that's something that we, you know, for some reason should be embarrassing that, that we go, Hey, I'd love a good, you know, whatever I mean, I like right a good now. Burp too, but... <laughs> um, like not the, the same shame as an orgasm. That, the shame that people place on sexuality, um, there's also like a social cr construct to it. There's a classism construct to it. Yes. Um, interesting. Like, did you know that they actually did a study on slut shaming in sororities? I mean, I'm sure there are several. Yeah, because it's pretty typical. So sororities slut shame a lot, like a lot, a lot. And what they found out was that the girls who they were slut shaming were doing the exact same sex acts as a sorority. Sure. And the reason why, like, they viewed those girls as slutty was the same reason that the girls, like, the girls who were being slut shamed the most by the people were not actually the sorority girls, even though they were doing the same thing or worse at times than the G the quote unquote GDIs. The I, as as a southerner, you know what a GDI is. I'm, I'm not sure I do. No, I grew up in L.A. No, it's, oh right, that was Los Angeles, not Louisiana. Sorry. Well, Georgia, because you went to college in Georgia. GDI yeah. is what they call the goddamn independent. God. Oh, and, independent. Okay. Yeah, the Eek. ones who did not rush. Sure, sure. Um, but what ended up happening in the study is that the independents, they would, they would try to slut shame the sorority girls, but no one would bite. But the sorority girls would go, oh my God, she is so slutty. Look at that. Look at that. And it, and that it stuff. stuck. And it stuck. They discovered that was actually a class thing. You can sit there and throw, and throw your vagina, throw your dick around anyone if you're a billionaire, in fact, like it'll almost be applauded, but yes, the lower right. down in the ranks you get, the more slut shaming will stick. If you're the yes. outsider, you're going to be number one with a bullet as far as slut shaming. It is absolutely a class thing and it's absolutely a control thing. And I've always had my own theory about this. It's never been proven scientifically. But I think that the reason that slut, that slut shaming sticks to the lower class is because the girls who get slut shamed are often the ones who are the most attractive. Mm. And the upper class is totally inbred is probably I mean, where you're going to go. Well, I was going to say, uh, I don't think that sorority girls are inbred, but I mean, I could be wrong. Some of them looked a little bit funny when I was going sure. to college. Well, I mean, think of royalty. European royalty was pretty goddamn inbred. So, hey, that's GDI. Goddamn inbred. Oh, my God. That, that's going to that's gonna be my new tag. Goddamn it. <laughs> Wait a minute. No, I don't want to call myself inbred. Ignore that. <laughs> um, Ignored. Stricken from the record. Yeah, but like the it's a form of mate retention or like, you know, okay. mate poaching prevention. If you're dating Mr. Alpha male Johnny football star and your sorority girl queen, you don't want the random goth chick to poach your boy because it would be a huge humiliation. And not right. only that, but like because you scrambled up to the top of the social pecking order, you feel entitled to that man. It doesn't matter if oh, he sure. actually likes the goth girl. Right, right. So you're going to slut shame her and go, oh, my God, she's so scavy. So that if he does end up leaving you, 
you can sit there and go, oh my God, she's a homewrecker. Even if he dumps and then starts dating you shortly after. Right, right. It's a great point. That's one of the things I think is happening. Like, there's definitely an element of shame. There's definitely an element of control there. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's actually one of the big selling points because sex sells when it's forbidden fruit. The more extreme the woman is, the higher it tends to sell. Right, right. No, I, I was I was told I could make good money um, as as a sex worker, you know, because I haven't quite haven't quite finished all the transition, and so I could make good money. As uh, what was the word for that? Was it just trap? Huh? There was a word for that, and I think it was trap. I can't. But uh, yeah. Anyway, I was still is that it's still yeah okay. Um. But forgive forbidden fruit. I think you you hit on something so huge because it's interesting to me. You had brought up that that there are people who end up huge supporters of you know the adult film industry and, and cam girls. Uh, it's interesting how many of those people seem to be religious. The biggest donors I know of cam girls are in the Utah area. Right, right. Mormon land. Yes. Which makes perfect sense because it's all forbidden fruit. And you go, well, I want it and I can't have it. So I want it even more. Well, one of the weird things that happens when you grow up in a cult or a high control setting, um, you start to express your desires in not normal, not healthy ways. Right. Yes. It's sexual repression and eventually it will come out. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm not the least bit shocked that Josh Duggar got arrested for what he did. You're going to have to remind me. I'm sorry. Who was, who was that? Uh, he's, he's the 19 kids and counting fundy guy. Oh, who got okay. Married, okay. Got married yes. to a girl. Yeah. You, yeah. So, sorry. Um, now I recall. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's actually more common in those um, groups than it is in the mainstream population. I believe from it. what I've yeah. seen. Mm-hmm. And part of it is because they don't have a way to talk about it. And then when they get exposed, it's, it's almost like a hit of cocaine. They start going back for more yeah. and more and more. They're like, I can't stop. They feel ashamed because they're told to feel ashamed, but they can't talk about it and they can't figure out how to like express themselves. And then it just kind of like snowballs from there. Right, right. But that makes good money in the porn industry. That kind of repressed feeling where they end up turning to porn or cam models because they can't turn to their wives or girlfriends. Right. So that's a big selling point for a lot of people. It is. And I guess, you know, that's where that's where I end up getting most upset because it's like we all like sex telling ourselves we're not supposed to have it only leads to people who are, who get screwed up, whether it's Victorian England or, you know, you know, by the way, I had, I meant to, to say, um, cause pre-revolution France, right. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Somewhat a bit of debauchery there as well. Right. I mean, you know, and how Marquis de Sade type, you know, um, Type writers, you know, it's, I mean, it was, it was a huge thing and everybody was fine with it. It was like, yeah, sure. We do mm-hmm. weird ass things because it's sex and it's great. And, and let's just and face it. They have didn't have that. Netflix back then. So what else were they going to do? Yeah. You had to act it out, right? What else are you going to do? But now we have people in Utah who have Netflix and then all the internet and they go, oh, I can't do anything. So I got to go and be, you know, weird about it. I'm going to go, you know, and. And I guess the hilarious thing to me is that, like, there are people right now who would probably go, "Oh, Amethysta, you, you, um, you know, you're you're transitioning gender, you're a groomer, you're, I don't know, sexually deviant, whatever." And it's like, "No, I'm perfectly normal." Like, well, you know, what are you doing in Utah, you know, or wherever? I don't want to pick necessarily on Mormons, but I'm singled out as like the weirdo for for being open about sexuality. I mean. Qua? It's 
It's weird because I, I noticed that the ones who tend to attack people the most are the ones who have a lot of unresolved issues surrounding yes. sex. And also right. they have, a lot of them are also deeply insecure. Mm -hmm. um, there are very few things that will set off a lot of women, like watching a pretty girl talk about sexuality and sex in general. Um, like, and I speak from personal experience that's usually when the slut shaming begins because they're saying they're, they're like, everyone else has had more sex than me. <laughs> and you know, right. it's normal to want to feel desired. It's normal to want to feel like validated in the sex department. Yes. And the problem right. with like, you know, life in general is that you don't always get that. And right. you can't force people to have sex with you. That's rape. So yes. you're just kind of stuck Oof. there with like a group of people who they're not getting laid. They're already feeling bad about themselves. And like the next thing that they hear is some dirty sex joke or some, you know, dear penthouse. I can't believe this could have happened to me. And it makes <laughs> them want to explode. The only way that they're going to shut that down is through shaming. Yes. So while yes. they're, so while there are like reasons to not talk about sex and I could see how shaming is a way to shut that down. I also realize the unhealthy version of it, the unhealthy mm -hmm. compersion that people have with slut shaming. It's a yes. very fine line. It's just the nuances are mostly lost on mainstream people. It took me decades to figure that out myself. I think you're on a good track for sure. I mean, I think, that, I think that all makes sense. Some people's kids. I think I'll just leave it at that. Some people's kids these days. <laughs> right. So so we've been talking a little more than 50 minutes. Um, can, so I know that you have about 48 billion different projects going on at a time. So <laughs> how does how would anybody find you? It's assuming, again, they're living under a rock. How, how does somebody find you? So first I'm going to spell my name, O-S-S-I-A-N-A -S 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 dot substack dot com. There that or on Instagram at Oceana dot makes dot content. Really simple. Those are your two big ones? Okay. Mm -hmm. I will I'm link not, those not, in the show notes. Yeah. I'm, I'm not giving medium my money slash. Yeah. No, don't do that. We don't need that. We don't touch the poo. Not, not that either of, a, of us, you know, has any issues with medium, right? I mean, just saying. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm going to be good. I'm going to be good. I'm going to be know, good. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm holding my breath till I'm turning red just so that people out in the audience who are listening know what that noise was. <laughs> you know, if enough, if... Anybody who knows either of us, I think, would 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 know that, that we've had a couple of, of words to say on on various topics, and you know, this is why you were a great person to talk about sex with. That came out sounding weird, but I think you got my point. So yeah, thank you for having me on. Of course, thank you so much. You, I mean, hopefully, you know how much I've you know I I loved reading you originally on some website. I don't recall what. Um, you know, it's great. It's great knowing you. I think of you. You're sort of like an inspiration. And uh, I don't know. Thanks so much. I get so inspired much. by you, too. Oh, thank you. It, if it's I had as much go-getting as you do, like, and also the focus. <laughs> oh, gosh. I don't even know what you're talking about compared to you. So, <clears throat> whatever. I mean, either way, mutual admiration, colleagues... This, this person is awesome. Yes. Thank you. Definitely. Well, thank you so much. I definitely appreciated all of this conversation. Awesome.